So we're being recorded. Well, I just want to introduce myself. So my name is Mike Kravitz, and I started working on Linux, I think, in the year 1999 or 2000. And since this is a mentorship series, maybe I'll share um, a little experience that I had. But my very first patch that I thought would be a good idea to submit to the uh, Linux kernel mailing list was a complete rewrite of the Linux scheduler in a monolithic patch. So not suggesting that anybody try that, as you can imagine, that didn't go over very well, but um, that was my introduction to Linux and introduction to open source. And even though I was flamed quite a bit for that, um, I continued on and have been working in the Linux kernel for, I guess, 22 years now. So for the last several years, I've been working in the areas of mem memory management. Um, specifically, I'm now the maintainer of the huge TLBFS file system, which is a file system that makes huge pages available to user applications. And so when I was asked to talk about memory management uh, in this series, I thought, well, probably the best thing to talk about is something that I know a lot about, which is the huge TLBFS file system. But to get there, to get to huge pages in Linux, you kind of have to go back to the very beginnings of virtual memory. So topics covered in this talk, I'm gonna start with some very basic concepts of virtual memory. And hopefully, you know, this may be very basic and very elementary for many people on the call, but I think it's important to kind of establish a baseline. And once we talk about those basics of virtual memory, we can talk about how huge pages fit into that virtual memory model. And then finally get to how huge pages are exposed to applications and used in Linux. And then finally, down at the very, at the very end, we can talk huge TLBFS specifics, which is really my area of expertise. So some of the expectations here is, is that when we talk about virtual memory and the virtual memory model, um, I, I am by no means an expert in this area. Um, I know the concepts, I know how it fits in with huge pages, with the work that I do, um, but I may not be able to answer all questions in this area, um, but I will help as much as I can. Um, another thing to keep in mind is, is that a lot of examples that I'm using will be based on Intel architecture, and that's simply because um, that is what I am most familiar with. And once again, my expertise really is in the huge TLBFS file system area, although I have kind of pretty decent general knowledge of the Linux memory management in general. So with that, let's get going and talk about the basics of virtual memory. So every system has memory, RAM associated with it, and we have processes that we want to run. So the basic question is, how do we make that system memory available to processes? And we use this, what's called a virtual memory or on-demand memory model to do this. And the first thing that we do is split system memory up into little chunks, which we call pages. Um, and on x86, I'm sure you all know that a page is 4K, 4 kilobytes in size. And one thing to also notice is that for each page, each little page in the system, we have a small data structure called a struct page, which describes that. And the combination of all of those struct pages put together is something that we call a memory map. So there's a struct page for each page in the system, and that describes that page. Those struct pages actually have some fields that describe that page. It has some flags which describe the state of that particular page, things like whether it's locked, whether it's dirty, active, up to date, um, whether it is poisoned, has a memory error associated with it, or kind of a PG head, which is kind of for uh, compound pages. 
It also has a reference count, how many people actually have a reference to that page and a map count, which is a count of how many times that page has been mapped into user space. So if you look at a struct page description in Linux, um, it's a huge union data structure but it's really 64 bytes in size. And again, there's one of these for each struct page in the system. So if we have system memory divided into pages and we wanna make that system memory available to processes, then it makes sense that a process, processes virtual address space is also divided into pages. So no big deal there. But we can also have multiple processes trying to get at that system memory. So in this simple chart here, we have three processes, all with a virtual address space, perhaps even the same virtual address space. In other words, the uh, virtual addresses for process A could be the same as the virtual addresses for process B and process C, and they all want to get to system memory. So how do we do that? How do we translate process virtual addresses to system memory. And the way that you do that is via something called page tables. So this next slide is kind of a high level view of what page tables look like. And I'm gonna go over this in a little more detail, but let's talk about some of the key things. Um, over on the left-hand side, there's a MM struct, which is actually a structure associated with each process. And within that structure, there's a pointer to something called a PGD or a page global directory. And that's just simply one page, which has a bunch of entries, as you can see here, that point to another level in the page table, which point to some other things, which point to the next level and the next level and the next level. And finally, down here at the end, we get to actually user data or these pages in system memory, these 4K pages. So that's kind of a, a lot of information, but let's go over some of the, the key pieces here. So if we go back, we see that there's these levels in the page table, PGD, page global directory, PUD, page upper directory, PMD page middle directory and PTE page table entry. And so each one of those tables is one page in size. And those tables are really just an array of entries, which each are one word in size. So doing the arithmetic here on x86-64 as an example, a page is 4K, a word is eight bytes, so we end up with 512 entries per page for each one of those uh, levels in the page table. And there's some definitions out there in the Linux source, pointers per PGD, pointers per PUD, pointers per PMD, pointers per PTE, and those are all 512. Um, one thing that I should also mention is, is that this chart, I'm gonna go back to it real quickly here, uh, shows a four level page table. Um, those have actually been up to five levels. There's another level in there that's commonly used um, on x86 today. And the number of levels in the page table is somewhat architecture dependent. Um, I'm just trying to give a high level overview here. So we'll use a, a four level page table that fits kind of nicely on a slide. So if we go back to this page table diagram, like I say, the PGD page, these are all one pages in size with 512 entries, but they contain these PGDTs, PUDTs, PMDTs, and PTETs. So what are those things? So those are typically called page table entries, and they're typed for the level within the page table that they are. And that just provides some error checking with the, within the Linux source code. And within each 
page table entry, there's a pointer to the next table page, for example, from a PGD to the PUD, or at the very end in the, at the last level, there's a pointer to user data. And those pointers are either a page frame number or a, an actual physical address where a page frame number is just a number of that page in physical or system memory. And one thing to note is, is that since those entries always point to a page, there's some extra bits available down at the end. In other words, we don't need to use those um, page shift bits at the end. So those entries also contain flags such as, is the uh, page actually present? Is it read, readable, writable? Is it dirty? Or something that's kind of important for huge pages is this page PSE or page size extension, which means that maybe at this level, it really points to user data where you might expect it to point to another level in the page table. So that's kind of a high level of what those page table entries contain. So we have processes, virtual addresses, um, pages going through the page tables to get to system memory. But how does that actually happen? So in a process, we have a virtual address, which can actually be split into various components. So at the very high bits of the virtual address, it tells us what PGD entry we look for. So we have this PGD shift down at the bottom of 39 bits. This is x86-64 specific. So if we shift the virtual address to the right by 39 bits, we can actually calculate um, the index into the PGD. The same for the PUD, the same for the PMD and PTE. And finally down for page shift bits at the end, we figure out where within that user data page, the data that we're looking for actually is, that that virtual address corresponds to. So what I wanted to do was just take a very quick walk through how we get from a virtual or a linear address in a process to the actual physical page in system memory. So as you can see here from the virtual or linear address, we get um, at the very high bits, we can get this offset into the PGD. Um, the next bits give us an offset into a PUD, offset in PMD, et cetera. So let's just take a very quick walkthrough of how that works. So we have a address in a processes address space, so a virtual address. And the first thing we do down here at the bottom is take that virtual address, shift it right, PGD, dir, shift, bits, mask off any upper bits, and we get this PGD offset, which tells us where within the PGD page a PGD T entry exists. And so if you notice that PGD offset is really just an index into that PGD page, some value between zero and 511. And once we get that entry to the PGD T, then that actually points to a PUD page, kind of the next level in the page table. And if we follow that, then we take the virtual address, do a PUD shift to the right, mask off upper bits, and we get this PUD offset, and we get the index to a PUD entry. Again, just like at the upper level, that's an index into the page and it points to the next level in our page table, the PMD page. And this should be no surprise. For the PMD offset, we take the virtual address, do a PMD shift right, mask off the upper bits, and we find this PMD T entry, which points to a PTE page. And 
with the PTE page. Again, take that virtual address, shift right, PTE shift, mask off the upper bits. We get to the PTE entry. And finally, we point to a page that contains user data, a, that page that we're ultimately looking for. And then finally, at the very end, we use that offset within the page to actually get at the data we're looking at. So yay. But as you can imagine, that's kind of quite a bit of work to traverse that, isn't it? To go from a virtual address to system memory, think about all of those calculations and everything that was needed in there, everything that happened in the page tables, getting the PGD offset, the PUD, and all of this stuff, traversing the entire page tables. That's quite a bit of work. And that's actually required every time we make a memory access to figure out where that uh, physical page is within the system. So because of that takes such a long time, CPUs typically have something called a translation look aside buffer or TLB. And a TLB is really just a cache of virtual to physical translations, or in other words, kind of that information that's kept in the page tables. So instead of traversing the entire page tables to go from a virtual address to a physical address, mm -hmm. um, the TLB really contains a quick way to say, this virtual address is associated with this physical address. One thing to note though, is, is that like all caches, the TLB is kind of a small resource. There's not a, uh, an unlimited number of uh, entries that we can keep in the TLB. So if we go back to our, how do we get from virtual addresses to system memory physical addresses? We basically start with a virtual address. Um, we look, is it in the TLB? Or actually the hardware does this for us. If it's in the TLB, we immediately get the physical address. And if it's not, in other words, you know, we take a miss on that TLB, we actually have to go and traverse the page tables again to get back to system memory. Um, typically what happens if we do this traversals is that that entry gets put in the TLB, that translation that we just did to go from a virtual address to a physical address. And, and how that happens is really hardware and architecture dependent. But, Typically, that uh, is the case that if we take a miss on the TLB um, and we have to traverse and look up that physical address that uh, the TLB, a TLB entry is created with that translation. So as I mentioned, the, the TLB, this cache of virtual to physical translations is somewhat of a limited resource. So I wanted to just share some of the sizes of TLB entries or the, the sizes of the TLBs and the number of entries for the various page sizes on Intel processors. And so we can see here for instructions to, you know, when you're actually executing an instruction, there's, well, it looks around, you know, 128 for most generation, um, Intel processors for 4K pages. If you're trying to do two, two meg pages, um, that number drops considerably. Similar for data pages. Um, but if you notice for one gig pages, um, the number drops quite a bit. Um, these over here are kind of second level, uh, second level caching TLB sizes. And the sizes there are somewhat bigger, but still not huge. So I talked a little bit of mostly about, you know, how we get from a virtual address in a process to the underlying physical address in the system. And I just want to point out that the kernel itself also uses virtual memory. Um, most of most kernel data is actually um, addressed with virtual memory. Um, there's a set of page tables that translates kernel virtual addresses to 
um, physical addresses as well. So this isn't just limited to processes. Um, the kernel itself actually uses virtual memory for most of its data. Obviously, um, it sets up all of this data. So there's a bootstrap process. There's other areas um, where it actually has to deal directly with physical addresses. But in general, um, you're a lot of the uh, a lot of kernel code really deals with virtual addresses. So, Mike, yes, uh, I, there are two questions I think that are relevant to the previous slide you were showing with the uh, virtual memory. Okay, One, the previous slide. right, the previous slide that you have with the table showing. This um, one, the TLB yes. sizes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first question is, depending upon the processors, how much virtual memories are there in any kind of processor system memory? Um, how much system memory or how big is the virtual address space of the process? I, I am thinking that the question is, uh, please uh, chime in anonymous, um, whoever asked this question, but I'm thinking that they're asking about the virtual memory size. Okay, so the virtual memory size of a process is quite large. Um, I do not know the specifics, but I think it's, you know, I'm gonna get this wrong, but it's, um, it doesn't use the entire 64 bits of a word size. It's maybe 52 to 54 bits in size, but it is a huge number as far as the virtual address space of a process. Um, how much physical memory is actually supported by the systems? Um, I, I can't really give you that number. I, I'm not an expert in that area. I know um, I have worked on machines with multiple terabytes of physical memory um, associated with them. And the virtual address space of any one process could easily address all of that um, physical memory. Looks like there is a follow on question. Does the number mostly same for Apple processor, M1 Max, M1 Ultra, M2? Can you repeat that at the same for, I'm sorry. Apple what? processors. Apple processors. Um, I am, I, I honestly, I have no specifics on what Apple is doing. Um, I, I was around a long time ago when, you know, even Apple used power PC processors. Um, they tend to switch. I'm not sure, um, you know, they were using Intel for quite a while. So this, you know, this would hold for Intel processors. I'm sure you're asking about the latest ARM processors and, and I'm not sure about the specifics there. Okay, okay that sounds good. Um, another question, um, various, you mentioned that various processes have the same virtual address. In this case, how would they access their own physical data? So if we go back, I'm gonna change slides here real quickly. Ah. So you all should see a, um, a slide with kind of a translating going from the page table. So when you start with a virtual address in a process, each process has its own pointer to this upper level PGD page, um, a, a page global directory. So each process has a unique start of the translation. And so by the time you get down to physical memory, all of these are, um, are, are different. So each process has a, a different starting point here in the page table traversal. And each process has its own set of page tables. So page tables are unique to a process. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, one more question. Um, how are page tables and TLB accessed? Are they directly addressable in physical memory? Um, yes, they are. The, the, um, 
there are the kernel actually um, sets up the page tables. Um, I didn't want to get into this, but um, let's go back here. So when a process um, actually wants to get a page of physical memory, the kernel is actually responsible for setting up the translation. It, the, the kernel has to first allocate a page of memory, you know, figure out which physical page of memory it wants to use, and then set up a translation from the virtual address in the process to that physical page. And that's with a page table, um, as we've described before. But think about this, the, uh, the very first page used by a process. Um, we have this PGD pointer over here at the beginning. And this PGD page doesn't even exist at this point. So the kernel has to actually allocate this page, um, set up this pointer, and again, allocate a PUD page, a PMD page, and a PTE page until it finally can point to that page that it originally allocated for the user data to, to be associated with that virtual address. So yes, um, those pages are allocated um, or allocated, accessed as, um, as physical pages as needed. Um, the creating of TLB entries is not, is somewhat architecture dependent. Um, on some architectures, you can actually populate those yourselves. Um, on x86, that's typically not done. It's um, the hardware does that um, after a TLB miss. Um, the kernel itself is more interested in perhaps flushing those TLB entries when address translations are no longer valid. But uh, you know, I, I think that's a topic that you could spend a whole session on. Um, and I don't think we have time to do that today, or I don't have the expertise, but hopefully that answers the question. Um, another uh, is that does that answer your question? Um, it's Gupta, I think, that asked the question. Okay, I assume it is. Um, and another question: uh, Can multiple processes use same physical memory, and how? Um, yes, they can. Um, so if you think about it, if you have a have shared memory, um, what you know, a, a shared memory segment, um, what happens is is that each process does have its own page table, but those page table entries at the very end, I'm gonna go back again. Um, these PTETs actually point to the same user data page for multiple processes. So how you get there is via the page tables. Um, the actual target can be the same in multiple processes um, if it's set up that way. There is another question, Mike. Um, could virtual addresses be same for two different processes? If so, how does hardware handle conflicts? Yes, actually, typically they are the same. Um, and if you think about it, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, otherwise, if they weren't the same in processes, you can have you know tens, maybe even hundreds, thousands of processes out there, and so you can't, you would run out of virtual address space if each process had to have a unique virtual address space. So processes typically have the same virtual address space. And Shua, can you say the question again? I, I forgot what the, the point of the question was, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Okay, that, that's okay. So the second part of the question is, if so, how does hardware handle conflicts when the two virtual addresses are the same? Okay, so what, so what happens is, is that, um, ah, if we get to this slide here, so the, what you really want to happen is to go from a virtual address to system memory is go through the, uh, this translation look aside buffer or we go through page tables. And as, as I've already mentioned, page tables are unique to a process. So they start at this uh, PGD pointer and that's unique to every process. So page tables are unique. Um, the TLB actually gets flushed between each um, process switching. So, you know, if we go from running process A to process B, we have to get rid of all of those TLB entries because they cache virtual to physical translations. So those are, I'm gonna say flushed. Um, this is another level where you can go deep because with all of these specter meltdown things, we actually use tagging within the TLB and you can have, but, but that, that's, that's too deep um, for right now. But essentially, um, since the page tables and the translations in the TLB are unique to a process, um, that's how you can have multiple processes with the same virtual address. So those, um, you know, we know what process we're, we're running. We use the page tables associated with that process and we clear the TLB between um, running different processes. Great. Uh, looks like we have like a few more questions. Would you like to take them now or do you want to make progress on a few slides? Um, yeah, let's, well, no, let's take a few questions now. Okay. Um, just for clarification, what does IDS stand for? Instruction Data and Stack? I think on one of your slides, you might oh, have had- on this one here? So the TLB sizes. So yeah, so ITLB stands for an instruction translation. So in other words, um, the, the instruction itself, whereas D stands for the data, which is the target of the instruction. Um, this S over here is a second level. So if you think about caches where you have a first level, second level, third level cache, um, these TLB entries are kind of, um, as I mentioned, it's a cache. These are kind of the lowest level one uh, right on the processor this themselves. Um, these are kind of uh, the second level uh, of the cache there. Hopefully that- L2 cache and L3 cache, and that's, I think- that's Similar, yes, yeah, similar. kind of the same concept. All right, the other question on this slide is uh, 4K, and 4K and 2, uh, 2M stand for what page size? Yeah, that's for the page size for either 4K pages or two meg pages or one gigabit, gigabyte pages. Okay. One more question, the, is PGD, page is going to be always one per process or can it can a process have more pgd pages um it, it's just one today okay. great and then uh, is virtual memory stored in secondary storage if so then what is its maximum limit of having virtual memory i think you answered this question earlier mike but um yeah go ahead yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure if virtual addresses are sh stored in secondary storage. I, I don't know how to answer or how to even interpret that question. Um, uh, can Deepankar, um, do you have a, can you elaborate on your question? I don't think your question is very clear. 
I, it looks like uh, um, secondary storage HDD. I don't think that really happens, Mike. Um, uh, it, uh, virtual memory doesn't get stored on any secondary storage, correct? Um, tech, not, I don't think in the way that the uh, person asking the question is concerned about. Um, Obviously, we can swap, we can write uh, memory to a swap device or something like that, but, but that's a whole nother topic um, and, and that's managed in a totally different way. And I don't think we can't, we don't have the, the time to go into that today. Right. Okay, great. And I think this is the last question. Uh, if two processes shared, share memory, then when they switch, switched, so do the memory also switch and where it goes? Um, if two processes share memory, um, so if two processes share memory, as I, as I mentioned before, the, um, it's the kind of the lowest level page table entry. I'm gonna go back to this slide, like this PTET for two different processes pointing at the same user data page. So if we're running in one process and you know this PTET points to a user data page and it, another process points to that same user data page, as we switch to that other process, um, you know, the data page stays there. That's part of system memory that, that doesn't uh, go away per se. Um, and when we switch to the other process, we just have a different set of page tables that ultimately point to that same user data page. Thank you, Mike. I think that's the last question we have. Okay. So with all of that said, let's finally talk about huge pages. So huge pages are typically associated with a page table level, either a PMD or a PUD in the page tables. The sizes are architecture dependent. Um, typically there's MMU and TLB support. Um, if you remember from this, that previous slide about Intel architectures and uh, TLB sizes, um, they had entries for different size pages, but in general, what huge pages are, are there, they are contiguous areas of physical memory. They have to be aligned to the huge page size. And I'm not sure how familiar people are with memory allocations within the kernel, but there's something called a, a buddy allocator within the kernel to allocate pages. And as long as your huge pages are less than this max order in size, they get allocated from this buddy allocator. Um, if not, there's something called alloc contig, contig pages. It's an interface within the kernel that can actually tries to allocate contiguous areas um, of an arbitrary size. Um, and huge pages can also be allocated, um, the physical memory for them in other ways. There's a contiguous memory allocator, allocator. Um, I know that sounds really funny, kind of redundant, but there's a CMA allocator, which actually can be used to allocate huge pages. There's a mem block allocator, which is actually the early, if you think about it, boot time allocator, which can be used to set aside memory for huge pages. And on certain architectures, even the firmware can actually um, be used to get contiguous areas of memory for use with huge pages. So what is a huge page then? So we, we've gone over this page table slide a bit, how to get from a virtual address to a page an actual page in the system, a physical page. Um, and if you notice down here, the PTE page points to a user data page. And in this case, the offset within the page is, this is a, a 4K page or would be a 4K page on Intel architecture. 
Um, so we could say that that page is at the PTE level. So for a huge page, we can actually have a page at the PMD level. So page table looks similar, but the PMD, instead of pointing to a PTE page, actually points to a user data huge page. Um, some things to kind of note here is, is that, well, how would you know that in the page tables? And it's one of these flags that in the PTE entry for this PMD entry, it has this page PSE flag set that says, I actually point to a user page instead of what I would normally point to, which is a PTE page or a, another level in the page table. And this huge page here is actually, since it's pointed to by a PMD entry, it's PMD, it's a PMD sized page. Um, so on Intel, this would be a two meg page. So you would have a single page that contains two meg worth of data as opposed to the 4K page that is at the PTE level. Um, if we take that one step further, we can also have huge pages at the PUD level. And in this case, the PUDT again has that page PSE flag set that says it points to a user data page as opposed to normally where it would point to as the PMD, a PMD page in the page table hierarchy. Instead, it points to a user data page. And in this case, the user data page is actually one gig in size. So that's, in a nutshell, kind of how huge pages fit into the page tables. And so the next question is, is that, OK, well, that's good and well, but you know, is it worthwhile to even try to use huge pages? And one thing that I want to stress on this slide is, is that huge pages may increase performance. As a matter of fact, there are certain applications, certain use cases where they really do. And if you think about all of our talk about virtual memory, page translations, TLBs, et cetera, the advantages of using huge pages is that there are fewer translation entries. So if you think just about, let me go back to this, do, do, the, uh, the slide for a huge page at the PMD level. So we kind of skip this whole extra level here for the PUD, PUD we kind of skip two levels of translation. So doing a going from the PGD down to the actual user data is less steps. And also that um, the amount of data that you get for each, that you can bring in with each um, translation is much less. So you can spend a whole lot less time actually servicing, less time um, having TLB misses. But again, this is all, dependent upon how your application accesses the data. Um, huge pages can also be a bad thing in that we have a less granular page size. So if you set up to use a one gig page and let's say you're only using you know, 2K of that one gig page, that's kind of a waste for you. Um, when we looked at that chart of Intel TLB sizes, you'll notice that there were fewer TLB entries for larger page sizes, for huge page sizes. And again, it really depends upon your access pattern of your application. And so I, I can't stress this enough. Um, there is no blanket statement that says using huge pages is going to increase performance. It could even, hurt your performance in some cases. So it's really up to the application developer or someone who wants to use huge pages to test this out, benchmark, 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 um, to know whether or not this is actually an advantage for you. And 
not only benchmarking, but you kind of have to have really good knowledge of your application and how you expect those memory access patterns to be. So if we, again, I was kind of pointing out, if we look at the TLB, number of TLB entries for huge pages, um, you can see compared to 4K to 2M to one gig, the number goes down as you um, increase huge page size or just fewer entries in the TLB for those. And so you're going to end up with potentially more TLB misses. It's, you know, it's a trade-off because the pages are of a greater size, but you have fewer um, entries to actually cache those translations to those pages. Um, one thing to note here is, is that the, the latest generation, um, not the latest, but um, one of the more recent generations of Intel processors, Ice Lake actually has quite a few um, TLB entries for one gig pages. So up until Ice Lake, um, most applications did not make heavy use of one gig huge pages simply because there were not um, that many TLB entries available to them. Mike, there are yes. a three questions um, for you on the Q&A. Would you like to ask? Sure, let's go to those. That might be a good time. OK. Uh, can TLB misses be monitored? If so, can you monitor them at the process level or only system wide? Um, yeah, you can monitor those. Um, I've done it using the perf utility, and you can monitor those at a, an application level. OK. Does that answer your question, Matt? OK. Um, if not, ask another question. Um, another question, Mike, a lot of 2M, 1 gig TLB entries are separated and limited. How are these entries designed? Full associated, two ways associated? Um, I don't know off the top of my head to tell you the truth. Okay. Um, and then I have another question here for you. For an application use like DPDK, would huge pages be helpful at kernel level also? Um, you're going to have to educate me on DPDK. I'm, I'm not uh, immediately familiar with that term. Um, Neeraj, what does DPDK stand for in this context? While you come back to us, Neeraj, with the D DPDK, um, I have another question, Mike. Does Linux kernel architecture based on any processor, whether it is AMD or Intel processor, can it be used to design the Windows or Mac OS architecture? I, I'm not sure I even follow the question, but uh, does that make sense to you, Mike? Um, no, it doesn't make much sense to me. Yeah. Okay, so Neeraj, um, when you um, go ahead and um, let, uh, tell us what DPDK means in this context. Okay, I think Intel provides DPDK library using huge table, huge pages to map packet memory. That seemed to be the context, Mike. For oh, okay. So, so I will say that the kernel actually makes use of huge pages itself. Um, some of its data structures, um, it has determined that it is advantageous to use huge pages for those. Um, I, I, I am not familiar with all of the kernel code and all of the um, instances where huge pages are used. I, I'm familiar with a few of those, but certainly not all of them. Um, but yes, um, to answer that question, it could be that there are cases, you know, places within the kernel where huge use, using huge pages does make sense. And, um, you know, if it does and it's not doing that today, um, that could be modified. What kind of applications require huge pages 
when is it needed? Um, that is another question. Yeah. So I, I guess the whole point here is, is that, or maybe not the whole point, but one thing to note is, is that, I mean, using huge pages is not required. It's, it's a performance um, enhancement improvement. Um, I will tell you some of the some of the more prominent use cases for huge pages are large applications. So my company, Oracle, um, you know, their database makes heavy use of huge pages. They have this shared global area that um, you know is huge, can be, you know, up to you know 75, 80% of the system memory. And they use huge pages to describe that. Um, JVMs actually uh, make use of that. Um, virtual machines, um, putting aside memory to back virtual machines, they're actually using huge pages for that today. So it's, it's not like um, huge pages are required. It's just that people have found that uh, performance increases when they use huge pages in these use cases. When we have large amounts of data and if processes are sharing the data, for example, in a database situation, having a huge page, using huge, huge pages might do two things. One is um, the, it will save probably the footprint because you, we don't have as many PTE entries. Would that be accurate? Yes, that, that, that is accurate. Um, and you're going to steal my thunder, but there's actually even more advantages to that with huge pages, but we'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, I won't jump the gun then. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then um, another question um, I have here is, does kernel use huge pages for its own data? Yes. I, as it helps reduce the CLB mislatency. Yes, it does. Um, it, it does use its own. As a matter of fact, on the very second slide, we showed that the uh, the memory map um, for the kernel, this big or this array of struct pages, that there's a data structure for each page in the system. They actually use the kernel actually uses huge pages for that um, that array because it accesses them frequently and and it's a, a large amount of data. So yes, there are are various things that the kernel itself uses huge pages for. Um, the, the text um, of kernel, the actual executable code, the executable instructions is uh, mapped as a huge page as well. Great. I think somebody came back and said DPDK stands for Data Plane Development Kit. Um, thank you uh, for that answer. Um, let me, uh, I have like three more questions, Mike. Would, uh, would you like to continue with questions or would you like to um, cover some material? Yeah, let's uh, continue the questions. Um, does huge page size determine at what level of page table redirection to user data made, PUD versus PMD? I'm not sure. I understand the question, but certainly, I mean, yes, the size of the huge page in use determines um, what level in the page table actually points to that user page, that user data page. Okay. And another question is, can the usage be dynamic? Does kernel page switch from normal page, huge page during execution? When is the decision made? Um, within the kernel, no, but um, that's a perfect lead in for our next topic, um, talking about transparent huge pages at the application level. Okay, we'll defer that then. Um, <laughs> I mean, the actual the answer, it'll be answered soon. Okay, so is it safe to tune the huge page size to increase my application performance without impacting the kernel performance? Um, Yes, I mean, th that, that really is specific to the application. Um, I, I'm sure there's some ways that you could 
you know, perhaps degrade kernel performance in some small way, but I, there's no direct way to do that that I'm aware of. So yeah, I, I think, you know, you, again, it's just experimenting with your application and your application use of huge pages and figuring out what is the best performance for your application. Great, I, that's all for the questions now, Mike, relevant to this uh, uh, presentation. Um, go ahead with your okay. presentation. Thank you. So now we're gonna switch into talking about huge page APIs um, that are available to applications. Um, and there's really two specific ways that you can do that. There's something called transparent huge pages or THP. And as you can imagine, since it transparent is in the title, um, the use should be mostly transparent to the application. Someone asked a question, you know, can the kernel automatically determine if it's good to use huge pages and do that? And that's what THP was designed around to actually with no intervention from the application or, or very little to actually um, decide whether or not it makes sense to for the application to use huge pages and if it does do that automatically. Um, the, other, the other API um, is huge COBFS, which is what I maintain and where my expertise kind of is. It's a much older technology. It was perhaps um, one of the earliest ways that huge pages were made available to applications. Um, and it actually requires application modification. So if you want to use huge TLBFS, you've got to modify your application to do it. Um, typically, huge TLBFS requires some type of sysadmin intervention or setup. In other words, um, it's not just uh, somebody running an application, um, somebody who actually manages, manages the system has to be aware that there's applications that want to use huge TLBFS and set that up at a system level. So again, back to scope in my area of expertise, um, I think THP is really kind of the, the new and the cool technology because applications don't need to think very much about it. Um, it should, it is designed so that it just works and applications get a performance benefit when using THP. Um, unfortunately, that is not my area of expertise. So we're just going to cover that briefly here and then dive into more specifics of huge TLBFS, which is where um, my expertise does lie. So THP, it's primarily used for anonymous memory. Um, in other words, if you think about, you know, your application data within your application, the, the heap that you have there. Um, it can be used for tempfs. So if you're on a most uh, Linux distros use a tempfs or a memory backed file system for slash temp, um, you could theoretically um, configure that so that it's always backed by um, THP pages, um, pages, uh, THP huge pages. And there's actually some support for mapping, file mappings or executable code or, or files. Um, it's only works with XFS now. It's, it's marked it as an experimental config option, but um, it, it seems to work quite well. THP is limited to a PMD size support today. In other words, um, on Intel, THP will give you two meg pages. That's, that's all that it does. Um, there's work, people have been working on extending that to, to have one gig page support as well, but um, that is not in the kernel code today. Um, there's kind of one big control file for THP, and that's this sysfs file that uh, I have here on the slide. And there's three modes that THP works in. Um, there's always, which means 
always for every application, try to use THP. There's mAdvise, which means use THP as my application gives hints via the mAdvise system call. And then there's never, which means never use THP. Um, the default on my desktop system here is mAdvise. So that's why that little that mAdvise is uh, in brackets there. If you actually um, want to use THP via mAdvise, there's, there's two um, flags or two advice flags with the mAd, within the mAdvise systems call. And so I'm not sure how sure people are, how familiar you are with the mAdvise system call, but it takes an address length, kind of a, a range of virtual addresses and you provide some advice on what to do with that virtual address range. And so you can have MADV huge page, which means try to use huge pages in this, um, this address range and MADVise no huge page, which means don't ever use huge pages in this address range. And so that's kind of how you um, work with that MADVise option enablement of THP. And if you want to play with THP, um, there's lots of tunables out there. Um, they're all under this sysfs file. Again, um, we get, there could be a whole mentorship session just on THP and how to use that in your applications. And we're not going to go over that today. Um, honestly, um, other people have much more knowledge about this than I do, but I just wanted to point out um, where these tunables were. So any quick questions on THP before we jump into huge TLBFS? I may not be able to answer them. <laughs> there are no questions in the okay. chat. At the moment. Okay, so let's let's get into huge TLBFS, and I can't answer any questions here. So, huge TLBFS is, like I say, an older way of using huge pages within your application, and it does require application modification. Um, and huge pages are generally pre-allocated uh, via some sysadmin control. Um, They've been used by databases for many, many years. I think support for huge CLBFS went in somewhere around the 2.4 kernel timeframe. Um, most recently, it's been used um, quite successfully to back virtual machines. Um, virtual machine code like QEMU, I think uses THP P by default, but um, more people have been setting up huge TLBFS and using that to back virtual machines. Um, huge TLBFS does have multiple huge page sizes, um, which is really defined by the architecture itself. It typically supports anything that the architecture does. Um, but one thing to notice is that huge TLB like I say, is very old and very simple. And so the concept is, is, is that you reserve or set aside a pool of huge pages or pool of memory that can only be used as huge pages and your application makes use of that pool. So setting aside a pool of huge pages means that they're only available for application use as huge TLBFS pages. Um, they can't be used by the kernel. They can't be used by applications. They can't be shared in any other way. They're just used as huge TLBFS pages and set aside for that. So that's kind of what I was getting at is that it requires intervention by a sysadmin kind of to set up these pools. It has to be done um, with privilege. Um, not just any user can do it. It, it requires a, a privileged user to do it. Um, and it, it really kind of requires, you know, not just application knowledge, but sysadmin knowledge and kind of some pre-planning to make this all work. I just wanted to share kind of the 
huge page sizes. Um, I picked not an Intel example here, but an ARM64 with a 4K base page size. And in this example, the huge page sizes that are supported on that system are, we have 64K, 32, uh, not 32, we have 64K, two meg, 32 meg and one gig, huge page sizes. And just as a general note for huge TLBFS, the sizes supported on the system, um, you can look in this sysfs sys file, syskernel mm huge pages, and it will have a directory for each huge page size that is supported on the system. And as you can see, where there's actually four huge page sizes that are supported on this system. But then the question is, you know, what is kind of a default huge page size? There's also the concept of a default. And there's a file proc mem info. And if you look at the huge page size field in that file, that tells you the default huge page size, huge TLBFS huge page size on the system. And the default is important because if you just say, I want to use huge TLBFS and do not specify a huge page size, you get the default huge page size. So I just want to point that out here. So as I mentioned, huge TLBFS, you populate these huge page pools, which is usually done by a system administrator. And there's kind of two ways to do that. You can do it at boot time on the kernel command line, there's uh, options to do that, where you say, what is the huge page size of this pool that you want to populate? And how many huge pages um, do you want to put into that pool? Um, recently support was even added. So this, you could have this format of huge pages to be like N1, Y1. So that would be Numa node one, number of huge pages is Y1, Numa node two. So you could actually specify huge pages to allocate on each Numa node. Um, huge page CMA can be specified at boot time. And that, and that what that does is actually reserves area for the contiguous memory allocator to allocate huge pages. And again, that can be specified on a per node basis as well. Um, boot time, you can actually change the default huge page size for the system um, that you're running by specifying that on the kernel command line as well. So that's one way to actually populate huge page pools. The other time is to wait until the system is up and running. And you can actually just write into a sysfs or proc file to um, populate the pools that way. So you would say, well, why would I ever do it one way or the other? Um, one thing is, is, is that, as mentioned earlier, huge pages have to be contiguous, contiguous physical memory. So as, a, as the system is up and running, um, typically we don't use huge pages and we allocate 4K pages. And the system memory itself becomes fragmented. We grab a 4K page here, a 4K page there. And pretty soon, there's not any big areas of contiguous memory to create huge pages. And so via memory management methods called uh, compaction and migration, we can try to create huge pages. But the longer the system is up and running, the more fragmented memory becomes and the harder it is to actually create huge pages on the fly. So doing things at runtime becomes more difficult. That's why some people may want to just do it at boot time before the system actually gets up and running and they can set aside these huge page pools that are much easier. So how do you make use of these huge page pools? Well, huge TLBFS is a file system. It was originally designed that way. So 
you can actually mount a huge TLBFS file system. Um, you mount it like you would any other file system. Um, and when you mount that file system, then all files in that file system are backed by huge pages. So one thing to keep in mind though, is, is that this is a memory based file system. So when you first mount a huge TOBFS file system, there's nothing in it, um, you know, and it goes away when you unmount it. So there's no persistent uh, storage, persistent state with that file system. All files in the file system are backed by huge pages. Um, the page size mount option says what size huge pages to use for this file system. Um, it use that, uses those out of that pool that was created up ahead of time. And most file file system operations actually are supported um, in the huge CLBFS. One notable exception is, is that the right system call is not supported. And by that I mean is, is that you cannot do a write system call to a huge TLBFS file. You can write to the file, you can populate, you can write to the contents of a file, but you have to do that via mapping the file and then actually writing to, you know, putting data into that M mapped area. You can also use huge COBFS uh, via system five shared memory. So there's a SHM get system call, which creates a shared memory area. And if you pass in the SHM huge TOB flag, that area actually gets backed by huge TOBFS pages. Um, you can pass in additional flags to actually specify the size of huge pages that back that shared memory segment. Um, so that's an, another way that applications can make use of huge TLBFS via um, share, system five shared memory segments. Um, the other way is the MMAP system call. So if you have a huge TLBFS mounted file system, you can MMAP a file within that huge TLBFS file system pass in open and pass in a file descriptor to a file. And that file is, of course, since it's in a huge CLBFS file system, it's backed by huge pages of that file system. Or you can also do mmap and pass in the map anonymous flag, as well as the map huge TLB flag, and you will get anonymous memory backed by huge pages. And just like the system five shared memory, you can specify the huge page sizes that are backing that, uh, that MMAP memory, that MMAP anonymous memory. And the thing to note here though, is, is that on the MMAP system calls is that address and offset within files have to be aligned to the underlying huge page size. Um, typically, you know, that's not always a requirement um, for non-huge TLBFS uh, MMAP calls, but that is a requirement if you're using huge TLBFS to back MMAP. Huge TLBFS, as I mentioned, you set up these pools ahead of time and your application makes use of huge pages in those pools. So, one thing is, is what happens when you run out of huge pages in those pools? Um, I'm sure you all have, you know, have applications that make use of memory. And typically what happens is, is that um, if you run out of memory on a system, the first thing is, is that the kernel tries to reclaim, reuse some of the memory that's in use. Uh, Worst case is you're going to get an out of memory error message and your process will be killed. Um, huge pages though, are not swappable. They're not reclaimable. So when we're out of huge pages, we're out. Um, if an application tries to make use of uh, huge pages, there's none available for them. They, they get a page fault. They try to uh, bring in a huge page, none are available. The application will actually get a SIG bus, which 
usually is fatal. Um, most applications don't have a, a handler to handle SIG bus. Um, so that's not so good uh, to actually uh, get a page fault and not have a huge page available, get a SIG bus and, and your process gets killed. So early on in huge CLBFS development, um, the concept of huge page reservations was introduced to try to mitigate um, running out of huge pages. So what happens is, is that there's a, there's a reservation count and, there's a res and that count is per pool. And what happens is, is that every time that an application does an MMAP or a shared memory or creates a shared memory segment with the SHM get call, is, is that a reservation of that size is set aside um, within the pool. So if you do an MMAP of, let's say, you know, 50 huge TLB pages, a reservation for those 50 pages is taken out at MMAP time so that as, the applic as you actually fault in those pages or allocate those pages, um, you're ensured that those 50 pages are available. So what that means also is, is that at MMAP time or SHM get time, if there are not enough pages available in the pool to reserve the pages that are needed, you're going to get an Eno mem um, at that time. So that reserve count, that per pool reserve count is incremented at MMAP and SHM get time. Um, it's decremented each time that you fault in a page or allocate a page. And there's actually, you know, more than just a global count but as you can imagine, keeping track of, you know, has a reservation for this virtual address been satisfied or not? There's internal data structures associated with each huge TLB mapping, whether it's anonymous or file, that keep track of reservations. So if you look at some of those global counters that are available in SysFS or slash proc, you're gonna see things like huge pages free and huge pages reserved. So just keep in mind that huge pages, you really might wanna look at also think about huge pages available, which is the huge pages freed minus huge pages reserved. So if it says, you know, 50 pages are freed, but 50 pages are reserved, there really aren't any huge pages available for a process to use, except for those that have already made those reservations. So huge CLBFS does have some very, some unique features that um, are not implemented in THP or general um, virtual memory at this time. So one of those features is something called PMD sharing. And what that is is, is that processes can actually share PMD pages in their page tables. Um, as I said before, and people ask questions about, well, you know, how can processes share access to the same data? And typically they have page tables that run down and point to those same user pages. Well, with huge TLBFS, we can actually share the PMD entries in the page table. And that can be for either file or anonymous mappings. Um, but since we're sharing a PMD page, the range that we share has to be at least um, one gigabyte in size, or in other words, a, a PUD size and aligned. So just as a quick example, why is this important? And so, as I mentioned, um, Databases like to use huge pages for shared areas. So as an example, it might not be uncommon to have a one terabyte shared mapping with 10,000 processes sharing that mapping. So if you think about it, that's um, a 4K PMD page 
per each one gig of shared mapping could be saved with PMD sharing. Um, if we have one terabyte, that's um, 1,024 times those 9,999 shared mappings. We still have to have one out there point to it. So we can save 39 gig of memory in this example by doing PMD sharing. So what does that look like? So here we have two processes. They're um, PGDs actually point you know, at the same, the PUDs at the level, but the PUDs actually point to the same PMD page um, in these two processes. So they kind of uh, share this PMD page, which points to the actual underlying um, huge pages. So this is a unique feature to huge CLBFS that you can actually share page tables at all. Um, there is some work underway to actually perhaps do more page table sharing in Linux, but um, this is kind of a unique feature to huge CLBFS today. Another unique feature to huge TLBFS is something called VMEM map freeing. And this was recently added in the 5.14 kernel. And VMEM map um, is actually a virtually mapped M map. So that entries are virtually contiguous. And, and this is a memory saving feature. If we go back to this early slide that I did in the talking about uh, virtual memory, I had this diagram that says, well, system memory is divided into pages and we have this memory map, um, which is a, a map, a struct page for each page in the system. And this is a, a little bit of a lie here showing that um, this memory map is one big contiguous area. What typically happens is a the sparse mem memory model is used to divide system memory up. And we divide it up into sections. And the memory map is associated with each section. So if you can see here, um, we have four distinct memory maps, and those are not physically contiguous. But through the use of virtual memory, we can actually map those things so that they appear um, virtually contiguous within the kernel. And so if they are all contiguous, then our page entries for huge pages are also contiguous. So if we look at a two meg huge page, um, we actually have 512 4K pages describing that. Again, this is an, an x86-64 Intel architecture. Um, we have a head page followed by a whole bunch of these tail pages. And so for these 512 pages with 64 um, bytes per page struct, we end up taking eight 4K pages to to contain all of these struct pages for a two meg huge page. So what, and if we look at this even more, all of these tail pages don't really contain useful data. All they do is point back to a head page. And if we look at a one gig huge page, we even have more of these out here. So what, VMEM map freeing does is it actually frees all of these extra huge pages, all of these extra pages of struct pages. I'm sorry, there's so many uses of the word pages here, but it frees the pages of struct pages down to the minimum needed to describe a huge page. So for a two meg huge page, it deletes pages two through seven um, and remaps those back to the second huge page. So basically we end up freeing five pages back into the system for other use. Um, that's pretty good. Um, it makes, it's even better 
for one gig huge pages where we can um, free up today 4,094 of those extra pages back into the system. Um, a change going into the next version, I think, in 5.17 is actually going to say that we only need one page of struct pages to describe a huge page, and so we'll get back another one. But um, this has shown this can also be you know, a way to save memory as well. It's kind of unique to huge TOBFS, although it's actually being added for persistent memory, possibly in 5.17 as well. So if we free up these um, struct pages that are used to describe huge pages, there is one downside though, is, is that these freed pages have to be reallocated before the huge pages can be uh, removed from the pool and given back to system memory. In other words, we, we need those struct pages to describe the, uh, the individual 4K pages once we give a huge page back to the system. So freeing a vmemmap is kind of an opt-in. Um, you have to specify it on the kernel command line. And the main reason why is, is that you, you actually have the situation now where you may not be able to free huge pages if you can't allocate the, uh, the vmemmap to uh, free them back to the system. So there's some config options that are out there. There's a boot kernel command option. Um, I, I honestly do not know how distros, if they're going to enable this option, but it is available out there in the, uh, the, the kernel source today. So just as a real quick summary on huge pages, and I, and I wanna go back to this first slide that I talked about, and then that is, Huge pages may increase performance. It really depends upon your application access patterns. Um, and just want to repeat again, the best way to do that, know your application and benchmark, 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 and you know, play around with these things. It, it may help you out. So that's all that I have um, open to questions. Sorry, some of that was very confusing, especially the vmemmap frame, but uh, I'll take any questions now. Thank you, Mike. We, ha we have a few questions. We're, we are at the um, end of our presentation, but we'll spend a few minutes for uh, questions, if that's okay with you, Mike. Sure. Do you have, okay. Um, what, the first question is, how does 64 kilobyte huge page size get, I think, I'm asking, I think I'm wondering, it's this, uh, how can you configure probably 64K um, huge page size? Okay, so, so what I was on that, um, on that slide that I had, um, that was showing the huge pages that are, the huge page sizes available on an ARM64 architecture. So um, the huge page sizes that are available really are architecture dependent. So you, you can't do 64K huge page size on x86 Intel architecture today. There is just, um, I mean, it, it's not easily supported by the hardware. So that's why I had that slide. Let me see if I can go back to it, where we actually um, list to go out and look at what size huge pages are available on your system. So if you go out to syskernel mm huge pages on your system, you'll see what sizes are supported on your system. So that's really up to the kernel code. When it boots, it will um, figure out what's available from the architecture, what it supports, and, and populate those sysfs files. And then those are the sizes that are available to you. Great. On mine, it shows just... Uh... I have AMD and it just shows the 2K and uh, but, I mean, the first two options. Yeah, you probably have a 64K base page size, maybe. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. 
Thank you. Um, the next question, I'm not sure this is relevant to this uh, presentation, Mike, but I'll read that out and make a choice. Is there an enable option for buddy allocator similar to CMA? What are the pros and cons of using buddy allocator versus CMA? I'm thinking this is uh, not in the scope of this presentation, but I'll let you decide that, Mike. Well, well, I talked about using CMA to allocate huge pages and I'll, I'll tell you why that was done. So as I mentioned, the longer the system is up and running, the more it gets fragmented, the harder it is to allocate physically contiguous areas. So use of the CMA allocator, what the CMA allocator does is, is that it sets aside an area that cannot be used for allocations that that cannot be easily reclaimed, um, that cannot be easily used by another process. Um, in other words, you know, the kernel typically doesn't allocate out of that contiguous memory area, um, things that are gonna be long standing. So, so what happened is, is that um, we reserve an area of CMA so that we can allocate huge pages out of that area later on instead of trying to use the buddy allocator to do that. So it just gives us a greater chance of being able to find a physically contiguous area for creation of huge pages after the system has been up and running for a while. Okay, so I have another question. Can a huge page set up a boot time to be overridden dynamically? For example, reducing the size or number of pages dynamically. Um, can, can you repeat that again? Okay. Can a huge page set up at boot time be overridden dynamically? I'm assuming- Oh, yes. The question Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it can. So, so if you set up something at boot time, you can change those numbers after the fact. Yes, you can. By going in and writing to those sysfs or proc files, as shown on the slide. Uh, another question: How does uh, copy on write interact with huge pages and shared huge pages? Two different questions, but you, you know, uh, oh. related. I, I mean, both. I'm. Copy on write for huge pages follows the same semantics as regular pages. Um, you know, the code to do that obviously is different, but um, the goal is to follow the same semantics. Um, if you don't, if you don't see that happening, let us know. Um, and what was the second part second, of that? Second, same question about copy on write interact with shared huge pages. Okay. Um, well, if you're sharing huge pages, th there really is no copy on write. So I, I don't understand that part of the question. Um, I mean, copy on write really has to do with private mappings or, or mappings where two different processes um, basically start out with the same version of the data and um, and when they write get different versions but if you're sharing a mapping if you're sharing a page um, and are designed to do that among processes copy on write doesn't really come into play you're always everyone is getting the same copy of the data okay so there Unless are lots of yeah, uh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, there, there, there may be some more subtleties that the person is asking about, but I mean, in general, that's kind of the answer. We have, um, uh, Megan, um, do we have time for a couple more questions or um, we could ask um, uh, yeah. them to reach out? Okay. Sure. okay. Um, the presentation will be made available um, after um, on the on our website after the presentation ends. So there are several questions regarding that 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 answers those questions. And then I am going to um, go to a question um, from Matt. Do KSMD or Numa D attempt to merge manage huge pages? Hmm. 
I don't know off the top of my head to tell you the truth. Okay, that's good. Um, then let me see, I'm parsing the questions uh, to pick the ones that um, haven't been covered kind of in a, in a way. Okay, so uh, there is one more. Is, is there going to be a video presentation on transparent huge pages in the future? Um, okay, that one, we'll, we'll decide on that. Um, uh, if Mike is able to do another presentation, presentation we can schedule one. And then um, there is another question, Mike. PMD sharing is feasible only when uh, all PMD entries have page PSC flag set. That means all entries point to huge pages. How is this guaranteed? Uh, well, first, you know, PMD sharing only happens when you set up um, huge TLB mappings. So, so by definition, the huge TLB mappings have PSE set, PSE set in all of their uh, PMD uh, entries. Hopefully that helps. But yeah, I mean, PMD sharing only works, is only enabled um, for, for huge TLB mappings, not for mappings in general. Okay, um, and uh, we have uh, one more question. Can we use huge pages of multiple sizes at the same time, like two different applications using two different size page, huge page sizes? Yes, you can. As in, in fact, you could even have one application using two different huge page sizes in two different mappings. So the huge page size is unique to a mapping, let's say, you know, an MAP call, a uh, SHMAT call. Um, so yes, with, with huge TLBFS, you can do that. With, with transparent huge pages, you are limited to the PMD size page. So there's only really one size available for that. With, but with huge TLBFS, yes, you could have uh, multiple sizes in multiple processes or even multiple sizes within one process. Okay. Why uh, can huge pages not be freed and reused like normal pages during out of memory scenarios? Um, well, because the only, I guess they were never designed to be that way. So they, are, they, are, they reside in memory only. Um, if they were to be freed at out of memory time, basically you would lose any contents there. So think about a file system, you know, containing data and we run low on memory and start throwing away the contents of the file system. Um, that's not good. Um, now there has been talk people, you know, if we have huge pages that are not being used by anybody and the system is running low on memory, you know, would it be a good idea to maybe throw away some of these unused huge pages that haven't been used and nobody's using yet? Perhaps, um, but, but that's kind of a, a policy decision and still something that could be discussed, but uh, we don't do that today. Okay. Does huge pages directly affect the database parameters, processes, and sessions? Um, does it directly? Yes. I mean, there is some, I, I think, you know, the database, Java, there's, you know, applications have options to say use huge pages or not during startup. Um, they may have intelligence even built into their startup programs to determine if huge pages are available and use them. Um, but that's really you know, how the application does that, um, I, I'm not aware of the details of that, but I, I do know that a lot of applications do have options to say, use huge pages if available. Great. Can multiple processes with shared huge pages all have right access to the shared huge pages? Yes, they can. As a matter of fact, that's kind of the, the way that uh, some of the sharing 
works in, in the database is, is that all of these processes can write to the shared area. Can virtual machines share data using huge pages? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, share with who? Certainly um, you can set up a virtual machine and in that virtual machine configure and use huge pages. Um, Typically, what people have been doing is before they set up a virtual machine, you know, you have to give it memory on your host to back that virtual machine. And people have been using huge pages to back the memory used by that virtual machine. So, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what sharing that question was asking about. Right. In some cases, you probably don't want to share. Be, uh, memory between virtual machines for isolation and so on so yeah i mean um, typically you do, do not at all yeah right so uh i'm sorry we are getting really close to the time i'm just going to um just do the last question here are there any protection for you huge page, pages against ohm killer um no so I, I think this, you know, maybe related to a question that someone else asked earlier. But um, when the Oom killer kicks in, it will not free. It will not try to do anything with huge pages. So, um, as a matter of fact, when you get a Oom out of memory report, what's written to the system log, it will tell you how many huge pages are out there. And and part of that is is you know. You may have misconfigured your system. You may have um, created too many huge pages and don't have enough memory available for other uses. So, no, Oom does not. Um, it just reports how many huge pages are in use. It doesn't modify, try to reclaim, throw away, or anything like that. Thank you so much, Mike, for taking extra time to do this. And there are several requests for you to come back and do the a transparent another presentation on transparent huge pages for sure well we'll have to get a transparent huge pages expert to do All right that. <laughs> right <laughs> that is true megan take it away Oh my gosh, no, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Shua, this has been amazing. Thank you all for participating and asking all of your questions. Um, we will be sure this recording ends up on our YouTube channel as well as on the webinar uh, websites. And um, Mike will share a copy of this presentation's presentation for us as well. And we hope to see you back at a future webinar. Thank you all so much.